Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good break and got to chat to a few people. I really liked the talks we already had. They were amazing, and I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about web animation. So I am actually a lecturer at a university. So I lecture in a web development department about mostly front-end development. And sometimes I write on my website a blog about mostly front-end development. And you can reach me on Twitter if you want to reach me. But let's talk about web animation. So when we build new applications, we have a set of tools we as developers or our company uses. And oftentimes, they need to be rec practical, useful, and efficient. It's like going to a hardware store and having a limited budget. And you get the most practical and efficient tools in order to finish the job or the website. So when people think of web animations, they more think of it as a nice to have addition, like the colors and sparkles added on top of a project, but not really that necessary. So the thing, so the thing I hear a lot at conferences is that people tell me their projects don't have a budget for animation, so they never end up doing it. Um, but just because a lot of projects don't prioritize animation, it doesn't mean animation is without value. The thing about good web animation is that it requires thinking about for who and with what goal you're building an animation. So if your animation is aimed at a younger person, it can add um, intuitive interactions like touch and animation are tightly linked. But maybe you're building an interface for an elderly person and maybe too much motion might be dis distracting to them and then you should reduce, reduce the motion. So when we want to do good web animation, we have to think about two things. And that's the user, of course, and then the browser, because the browser is our tool on how we build web animation. So when we do animation for the user, there's a lot of good things animation can do. It can help the user orientate himself. It can grab the user's attention. It can give the user feedback and make wait times seem shorter. And we can make use of how we perceive color and speed and take advantage of that. And then if we do animation in the browser, there's things we have to think about in the browser, about web standards, about making animations also accessible, about how the browser renders our animations, if we should, if we should do CSS animations or JavaScript animations, how we make our animations to be performant and what devices our animations are going to be playing on. So if we do animation in the browser, there is four things a browser can animate really cheaply. So we can animate position, so transform translate X or translate Y. We can animate scale, so scaling elements up and down. We can rotate elements, and then we can change the opacity. If we wouldn't know how to do that, we might do this. So we might animate the left property and then transition this left property when a class is added. But that's really unperformant because the left property um, triggers layout. So for the same example, we would use the transform property. We, we'd use transform translate x, so translate it on the y-axis, and then transition only the transform property, which is a lot more performant. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, the transform property is very powerful. You can do a lot of different things, like I already said. Um, you can also chain multiple different transforms. And the order matters here. So which um, keyword comes first is important because it's going to change um, where your element is going to end up. So this is a code pen from Dan Wilson. And if we chain them differently, the same, the same transform transforms, the element is going to end up at a different position. So we have to keep that in mind if we use multiple transform properties. But what, what does actually happen if we change a CSS property? So how our, our pixels are generated in the browser, in the first step is always having some JavaScript changes, like a DOM element added to, to the DOM, or a hover interaction on an element. So it doesn't have to be JavaScript. It can also be some CSS event or another event. And then when I change a layout property, like width, margin, left, the browser has to go through style recalculations and through layout. So it has to figure out how much space every element needs and then reflow the whole page. 
So this is um, a step where we shouldn't animate with, with margin left with all these layout properties. So if we want to be more performant, we'd maybe um, animate paint properties. Paint properties are properties like text color, background, box shadow, outline. If we animate paint properties, we can skip, skip the layout step, but it's still not the most performance step. So the most performance step is the composite step, where we have transform and opacity. And if we animate on this last step, we don't have to go through layout and paint. And that's why it's more performant, because the browser doesn't have to figure out all the elements and all the painting um, properties. And all of this has to happen in, in one frame. So if we take longer on the layout step, um, we're going to lose frames and have less frames. So one takeaway is try to use CSS transforms and opacity for most animations. You can also use other properties, but test them and see if they're performant on, enough on your device, on weaker devices. Another good tip is to promote elements to new layers if animated often and consistently. So we can put elements on new layers by, for example, using the will change property. So I'd say will change and then the property I'm changing consistently. Um, we can also create new layers by using 3D transforms. So for example, translate set or translate 3D. And then there's other things that create new layers like animated 2D transforms or being on top of a compositing layer or animated CSS filters. So I made a little example to demonstrate you um, how we can look at layers in our browser. So I created these three turtles. Each turtle has their own div element. And if I didn't know about animation, I might change the margin property when I hover my turtle. So now there's no animation, so I might add a transition on this margin property which is quite unperformant because it's going to trigger layout and it's going to influence the other turtles. So now I can look at the layers and I can see in the layers tab in my DevTools that I only have one layer. And what I also can do is turn on paint flashing so I see what needs to be repainted. And now I see if I have a one turtle, all the other turtles need to be repainted as well. And the FPS meter shows me how much memory I'm using and how many frames per second I'm having. So if I want want to make this better, I'd, um, transform, trans I'd use transform translate y instead of margin, for example, and then I'd transition the transform, of course. And now, if I have a turtle, it's not influencing the other turtles, and I don't need to do relayout. And now I see that my turtles get their own layers when I hover them, and then the layers are removed again. Um, but what I, what I also saw is that if I hover the first turtle, the other two turtles also need to be repainted. So I could give a layer to each turtle by adding the will change property. And now I see I don't have any paint flashing anymore because they're not influencing each other. So that's good. Adding new layers is good, but you shouldn't create too many layers because um, each layer consumes memory. And it, if you have many, many layers, it will decrease your overall performance. And if you have hundreds of layers, you might even crash your browser. So you should create layers, but you should remove them if you don't need them anymore and use them sparingly and where needed. Um, how would we remove layers? Well, we could only add them maybe with a class when, when we need them and then remove this class, or we can add and remove the will change property with JavaScript. So, the DevTools are really important for performant, performant animation because they show me if my animation is working on different devices. And I want to show you how to test your animations. So if you have, have some animation, you'd add some transform animation, for example, some transitions. And then you have different um, tabs. We already looked at the layers tabs and the paint flashing, but if you really want to test your animations, you're going you're gonna to use the performance tab in the, in the top. So now I added an animation, and now I want to test that. So I'd go to the performance tab, I'd click record, I'd have some in interaction or play my animation, and I get different things. And then I see my screenshots where my interaction is happening, and I want to look at that more closely. And then I get this summary in the bottom telling me about how much scripting time I'm having, how much rendering time, how much 
painting time. And these will be different depending on which property we're changing. And then what I also can do, what's very useful, is um, slow down the CPU. So if I slow it down a lot to, like, for example, test for more mobile devices with slower CPUs, um, I see that my performance looks a lot different. So now if I select the same, the same interaction, I can see in the bottom summary that the, the rendering part is a lot bigger because my CPU is not as strong. So I can test um, also my animations for weaker devices, which is important because you don't only want to run it on your very strong laptop, but also other people with like maybe slow mobile phones are going to look at your, at your animations. So test your animations, look at the performance top, look at your summaries, um, turn on the paint flashing to see where problems are or maybe where elements are influencing each other. And if we look at the performance summary in the bottom, we can see that these steps and these colors are quite similar. So if you have a lot of yellow, maybe you have very complex JavaScript that's not very performant. If you have a lot of um, rendering, maybe you're ch changing um, layout properties. If you have a lot of green paint composite, Mom normally you have really little green because it's very performant and that's where we animate. And the second thing I want to talk about is animation for the user. So where can animation help solve problems for the user? And how can we use animation to give the user a cognitive boost and reduce his mental load? So one good application of animation for the user is orientation and transition. So in interfaces, we essentially provide the user with information spaces and where the information, whenever this information space changes, instead of just jumping from one space to another and having hard cuts, um, we can transition slowly between those spaces. So a little example would be this one. It's a website that has transitions whenever we go to a different page and they change the whole color and they transition transition slowly between the different space, spaces and transition the color and, and transition in the new elements. So the user realizes, okay, this is a new page and these new elements are coming onto the page. So each time a new page is rendered, the user must re-evaluate re where they are and what has changed on this new site. So the brain has to think, does this page look the same as the previous page? So if it doesn't, what has exactly changed? So by making use of transitions like that, we can help the user to reorientate himself in the information, information space. And we can explain relationships between different elements and how they belong together. I'm going to show you a little example I built. Um, what I do a lot now with transitions are Vue.js transitions, but there's also React transitions. And most frameworks now have some kind of transition option. So I built this tiny little app with um, the location and the date. And what's transitioning is whenever I'm clicking a button, I'm tra transitioning the component um, in between. And I want to show you the code on how to build such a transition because it's quite easy with Vue to do. So I'd have um, some kind of data um, where I'm toggling. Whenever I'm clicking a button, I'm to toggling this variable. So this variable can be location or date. And then in view, um, I'd have some kind of parent wrapper like my app, and then I'd have a transition component. And the transition con component always takes a name, and it can also take a mode. So the mode here says that um, the current element transitions out first, and then when that's transitioned out, the next one is going to transition in. And then I have two components, and they're only visible if the variable is location or if the variable is state. And otherwise, it's not visible. And then if I want to define the animations for that, I'd have view transition classes. So view um, offers six classes, three for enter and three for leaving. And these classes are defined over the name attribute in my transition group. So I'd give um, my transition the name page. And then in my CSS, I can define my transitions in CSS. So I'd say, I want to have a transition when my component is entering. 
and it should transition my transform and opacity property. And my transition should be um, ease out, for example, because it's entering. And then when it's leaving, it, I'm transitioning the same properties, but my easing is ease in, for example, because that's better for leaving animations. And then I define um, what the elements should be before and after they're leaving. So they should leave to um, not visible and go to the right. And before they're entering, they should be not visible and come in from the left. So I'm defining these entering and leaving transitions. And it's not that much code, but it helps the user to realize, OK, this is leaving, and this new element is coming in, and I'm changing something in the informa information space. So that was that example, to look at it again from the code. Another good example for animation is perceived performance. So there's a quote by Chris Harrison that says, human perception of time is fluid and can be manipulated in purposeful and productive ways. That's out of a paper that's called Faster Progress Bars, Manipulating Perceived Duration with Visual Augmentations. And what they found in their paper is that animated progress bars reduce the perceived duration by 11%. So animation helped the user feel like he wasn't waiting as long as he was waiting. And some more numbers on perceived performance. So there's a book called Usability Engineering by Jakob Nielsen. And he defines some general timings. So 0 0.1 seconds of wait time will feel instantaneous to the user, so he won't notice it. If you have one second of wait time, the user will feel the pause. And if you have five to 10 seconds, it will be hard for the user to maintain attention and he might lose interest. So you shouldn't have wait times that are that long. A good example for perceived performance would be loading animations and kind of hinting on what's coming or hinting on how the page is going to be structured. So here it's slowly transitioning and then it's coming in from the left and the colors are already there. And also it's not quite loaded. The user kind of gets an idea what the page is going to look like. So some good example for perceived performance would be to indicate some kind of activity or progress, like when the page is loading, or to hint on something that's coming. So the most um, popular example for this are skeleton screens. Facebook does this a lot, but also a lot of other applications show kind of where content is going to be and then animate in the elements when they're loaded. And then the last one would be using this delay time to inform the user. So give him more information, make his wait time more useful so he's not waiting there and getting bored. I want to show you an example with the Web Animations API on how you could build a little loading animation. So how, how do we use the Web Animations API? We use the Web Animations API in JavaScript. So we get an element with JavaScript, and then we call the dot animate function on this element. And the dot animate function takes two parameters. It takes the keyframes parameter, which can be an object or an array, and then it takes the time and timing object. So the keyframes um, can be an object, like just mentioned, and then you'd say the CSS properties, and you'd give them an array of um, to what values they should change. And the keyframes array, array has different objects, and each object would be kind of a frame of my animation. And then the second argument in our function is the timings object. And the timings of object defines how fast my animation should run, how often should it run, what, what should ha happen after it's finished. So I can define things like duration, iteration, direction, delays, and delays. And all these keywords, they're really similar to CSS animation. So if we look at an animation in CSS, this is how we would define a little stretch animation in CSS. So we had, we'd have our keyframes, um, keyword and the name, and then the different stages. And then we'd call this animation with the durations of our animation. And if we do the same thing with the Web Animations API, We'd call the .animate function, and then we'd give the keyframes to this .animate function, which is similar to how we define keyframes in CSS. And we can also define the percentages, like in CSS, with the offset keyword. 
and the offset can be between zero and one, and in CSS it's zero to 100%. And then it's doing the same keyframes offset like in CSS. And then I'd have separately the duration object, um, which also has the same keywords like in CSS because it's in the browser and it's using the same engine. engine. So it's very similar um, to how CSS animations work. So this is the loader um, I built with the Web Animations API and I'm gonna show you. It's just some text and then there's another text element on top of it and we're animating some clipping and the cursor. And that's the HTML for that. So if I wouldn't know um, about how to do performant animation, I could animate um, the width of this element, but that's not so performant because it triggers layout. So instead I'd animate a clipping element so here I added an SVG element with no width and height and it had a clip path defined inside. And I can um, use this clip path in my CSS to clip my text. And that's the element I'm gonna animate. And then the second element I'm gonna animate would be my cursor that's going from left to right. And for my CSS, so I'd have my title element that has a white color and then I have a pseudo element on top that has the pink color and that has the clip path defined on it, the SVG clip path. And now I can access the, those elements in JavaScript. So I'd get my clip path and I'd get my cursor and then I'd define my durations for my animation. So my duration is two seconds, I have a linear easing, um, it's going on infinitely and my direction is alternate. So it's going forward and then it's going backwards again and forwards and backwards. And since both have the same timing, I'm, I can define this one object and use it in both animations. And then I'd call the .animate function on my clip path. And there I'm animating the CSS transform property from with the scale x. So I'm scaling x from zero to one. And then I'm, for the cursor, I'm animating the trans, transform translate property and animating it from left to right and they both get the same duration object I defined before in JavaScript. And that's that animation. But the Web Animations API can do even more. So what I get with the Web Animations API are controls. So whenever I call a dot animate function, it returns an animation object. And I can do different things with this animation object. What I could do, for example, is add a click listener on my title, like here in the bottom, and then I'd, I could increase the playback rate of this animation object, which would make the animation faster. So this little piece of code, um, if I would start clicking on this title, it would get faster and faster and faster until it's hard to process and essentially too fast to like see. Um, yeah, and I have different controls I can use. So I can pause an animation, I can play an animation, I can cancel an animation, which is great if people don't want to have animation for accessibility reasons, because some people can get dizzy or can get nausea if the animations are too fast, so they might not want your animation. I can jump to the end, I can reverse it, and I can change the playback rate, make it faster, make it slower. And then I also get callbacks. And then with the callbacks, I can say, well, when my animation is finished, call the following function or add, call another animation. And I have an on cancel callback where I could maybe remove an element once it's faded out and I don't need it anymore in my DOM. So why is the Web Animations API great? Well, it's an API provided by the browser, so it's native. You don't need to load an extra animation library. And the Web Animations API can render animations over the compositor thread. So your JavaScript is running on the main thread, but the Web Animations API and CSS animations, they can run on the compositor thread. And that's great for performance. And it's in general a, nat a native and more powerful alternative to CSS animations, because when we create a lot of choreographed and chained animations, at some point of the three or four chain animations, it's hard to do in CSS. And that's where you would want to choose the Web Animations API. A uh, little note on performance. So this is a code pen that demonstrates this difference between the JavaScript main thread and the compositor thread. So here we have four libraries, GSEP, Velocity, PopMotion, Animate.js. All those libraries animate in JavaScript. 
and then we have the CSS animations and the web animations API. And if we, if we run it, um, they all run very smoothly, but then we can add JavaScript stalling in the top and then we'll see that all the libraries kind of get more janky, whereas the CSS animations API and the web animations API run smoothly because it can run on the compositor's thread and is, not, is independent from the main thread. The problem still with the web animations API is that the browser support isn't fully there yet. It's still an experimental feature. So we have it in Chrome, we have it in Firefox, in Safari it's under the experimental flag. It's already in the technological preview, but there is no edge yet. But um, if you look at the platform starters, there is a lot of votes on it and you can vote on it too. So if the more votes there are on it, the more likely it's go going to come into, into Edge. If you need wider browser support, there is a polyfill, but it's not recommended by everyone. So a few people say that it's, it's better to fall back to no animation. But if you really need to have this browser su support, you could use the polyfill, which is kind of a JavaScript implementation of the Web Animations API. And the next last very useful application of animation is attention and feedback. So feedback is very useful for the user because we can give a, with animation, we can give a reaction to, to what he's just done. So um, button animations or whenever a user does something in, in your interface are very useful to use animation. Um, you can show cause and effect of the user's input. So for example, if he's filling out a form and he's, he made some error, you could add some animation to show him that he needs to check this again. And it's also very good to make system activity visible. So maybe he sent the form and then your system is busy and the user is waiting and then you should show him that the system is busy. There's one really good example for that. So this kind of demonstrates all of the, those three things. So I'm entering a password, then my system is busy, so I'm showing some kind of animation. If I'm entering it wrong, I get this um, error animation that's kind of attracts attention. And if I'm entering right, I kind of get off this, this confirming animation. And that helps the user to see he's done it right or he's done it wrong. And the second part, attention, is really useful to grab the user's attention. So to show possible actions, like if he's in an interface and I really want him to see that he can interact with something, I can add an animation to grab attention to a certain element. I can also use animation to teach the user about a process or to use it for storytelling. This is a good example for SVG animations to explain how something works instead of just putting a long text there because users like to watch videos to understand something and storytelling is a good use case of grabbing a user's attention and teaching them something. And then also to add some fun and reinforce branding is a good use, use case for animation. So if they read a lot of information, it's maybe nice to add an animation to make an interface more fun. And a good example for this is Stripe. So Stripe has a lot of small micro interactions in their website. And here what they do is they have this like interface in their interface that's kind of animated and you can click on it and it's, it, it makes it more fun to interact with and it, it grabs your attention and maybe makes, makes you read more what it actually can do. So grabbing attention, what we'd call it in animation would be also reactive animation, so animation that reacts to user input, that reacts to mouse clicking or moving your mouse. And a way to do that in um, JavaScript with, would be with JavaScript and CSS variables. So this is um, very useful to add more interactive animations. How we would use um, JavaScript and CSS variables? Well, we'd get an element and then we'd get the style property of that element and then we could set a CSS variable on this, on this element by calling the set property function. And then we get the name of the variable and the value of the variable. And to use that in CSS, so this is not doing anything yet, but you need to use that variable in CSS. 
So you'd call, um, you'd think about where you want to use it. So you might use it in a transform translate. And then you'd call that variable with the var keyword and the variable. But when we think about animation, um, one thing to note is that CSS variables are inherited from, from the parent. So we shouldn't set it at the body element, but we should set it at the most specific level where we need it. Because if we change this variable a lot, um, it's going to cause diary calculations in all children that use this variable. So I made a little example for this too, to demonstrate you how to use JavaScript and CSS variables. So I found this lovely illustration at the bottom of the FFCon site. And um, I decided to add kind of a reactive an animation to it. So I kind of created this parallax effect on this little illustration. And this is quite simple to do with um, JavaScript and CSS variables. So in order to create that animation, what we need to do is um, have a parent element and then for each element, for each parallax layer, have an own layer. And each separate layer will be animated differently, but they all will inherit the variable from the app ID. And then I'd calculate my variables in JavaScript. So I'd get my element where I want to set my variable on. I'd add a mouse move listener on my document. And then I need to calculate my CSS variables because then I'm going to use them in CSS in different ways. So what I get from the mouse move event is a e client x, and that's a pixel value, and that's hard to use in CSS. So what I actually want to have for x and y are values between minus 1 and 1. So what I do is I divide my client x through my window inner width, and then I get a value between 0 and 1. But I want 0 to be in the center, so when my mouse is in the center, that it doesn't, doesn't move, and if it goes out, it moves to the left and right. So I subtract, subtract minus 0.5, so I get a value from minus 0.5 to 0.5, and then if I multiply it by 2, I get a value from minus 1 to 1, which is perfect to use in CSS. And then, so I can use it in CSS, I need to set these variables on my parent element. And then in my CSS, for each layer, I can add different transforms. So the stars are maybe more in the front, so they're going to move further. So I'm going to use a Translate 3D because they're um, animating consistently. So with a Translate 3D, I get different layers for each element that I'm moving. And then I'd use the Calc keyword. So I multiply my minus 1 or 1 or 0 variable times the amount I want that element to move. And I do that for Y as well. And then I'd get different pixel values if, if a layer is more in the front or more in the back. So um, here the, the house has like um, a multiplication with maybe four pixels and then the star has a multiplication with like 20 pixels. And that's what generates this, generates this simple parallax effect. And what's great about JavaScript and CSS variables is that they're quite easy to debug. I can see them in my DOM. We don't have excessive DOM manipulations, so before CSS variables, we would have needed to change the transform on each layer in JavaScript. But now what we can do is just add the variable on the parent and then just for all child elements, define the animation in CSS. So we're kind of DOM node independent. And they're really great for reactive and physics animation to make something more, more reactive to user input, to make people Get into, get into your interface and grab their attention. And also what's really great about them is that we can transform individual properties. So in the beginning we've seen the chaining of different properties and whenever I want to maybe only change the scale, but then I also have a translation that used to be very annoying in CSS. But with the CSS variables I can transform only the rotation by only changing the CSS variable, for example. So some opportunities for animation we, we just heard. You can make idle time more useful and interesting for the user. You can guide the user in a process by showing him where he needs to click or where he actually made an error or where the system might be busy. You can explain relationships in your information space, so why an element is appearing, why it's disappearing. And you can get the user's attention to show him what's important and what's not so important. And if you want to learn more, if you, if you 
enjoyed um, watching these animations and you want to create your own animations, I want to share some animation resources with you. So there's a really good book called Animation at Work by Rachel Neighbors, and it's about how to prioritize animation in projects and how to pitch to clients that animation is important. There is a Twitch and YouTube channel by David Kurschild and Stephen Shaw, and they kind of live code interface animations, and you can learn a lot about animation just by watching that. There is a Slack channel with um, a lot, a lot of people that share inspiration. You can post your animations when something is not working and get feedback. And there's a lot of um, also popular animators there that will help you and tell you why your animation might not be working. Um, the Google fundamentals have a lot of um, resources on things like performance and rendering to better understand how animation works in your browser. And then there's a really good UI animation newsletter by Val Head that shares a lot of inspiration for UI animation and how to create fun and useful animations in user interfaces. Before I go, I want to share one more quote with you. So this quote is by Heather Deckard and it's out of the Animation at Work book. And it says that users should only notice your animation if you need to attract their attention in that moment. Otherwise, micro interactions and other transitions should be so seamless that users don't even notice that there is animation. So animation doesn't, doesn't really always have to be big and you don't always have to grab a user's attention because good animation often is invisible. And you should keep that in mind. So you should animate for the user and not create obstacles, not just animate because you just want to have a fancy animation. Think about who, who you're building this animation for and why, why you're building this animation, so what goal your animation has in the end. Thank you.